welcome to Fundamentals of Machining. Um, I'm Carter. I teach classes around the makerspace. Uh, I've been, oh, we'll start with the SSD slide. So if you don't know, you're at the makerspace. Uh, these classes are operating with a $20 requested donation. Not required, but it helps out. Um, I teach these classes mostly for fun and uh, helps bring people into the makerspace and let them know the makerspace exists. But uh, yeah, uh, makerspace has been losing money since COVID. Uh, if you're willing to help out, spread the word. Let people know we exist. That's that's basically it. We need like 10 more members and, we, and we'd be cash positive. So uh, exciting, yeah. Um, who am I? Uh, I've been an SSD member for about six years. I've been on the board for about four of those. I'm a professional robotics engineer. I work at a company called Amp Robotics that makes recycling sorting robots. Uh, I spend most of my day as a computer programmer, uh, but technically I have a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, I'm a hobbyist machinist. Um, so I've been machining for eh, about as long as I've been a Makerspace member. Um, learned how to machine at the machines on the Makerspace here and operating the old CNC machine, which was a member conversion. So I have some knowledge. I would not consider myself an expert, but I certainly know how to get some parts made uh, if you try. Uh, most of what my experience is in machining aluminum because robots. Um, so yeah, here's some examples of parts I've made on the CNC machines at the Makerspace. Um, I like to build little three pound battle bots. These are just the parts I like to show off. So lots of fairly simple um, parts, but still very, very fun. And you can definitely get some good tolerances out of these machines. Um, this class is set up as uh, all of the fundamentals that I think you would need prior to diving specifically into like Fusion 360 for programming a CNC machine. Um, but it's also really useful if you're going to go into manual machining and use the manual later in the mill here. The knowledge that I'm trying to equip you with is what's actually going on as material gets cut, how the cutting happens, and build some intuition for like what are the right ways to change what you're doing instead of what are the wrong ways because a lot of the behavior of the machines are counterintuitive. So we're going to start with the actual physics of how the cutting happens. Um, feel free to interrupt me for questions at any time. Um, starting at kind of the highest level, uh, machining is one subcategory of subtractive manufacturing. Um, subtractive manufacturing is any process where we're starting with more material and going to less material through some process. Other subtractive manufacturing operations include uh, like laser cutters, water jets, grinding. Those are all types of subtractive manufacturing. Um, and in subtractive manufacturing, there's a fundamental problem, which is that it takes energy to deform and separate material. There is energy in the atomic bonds of the metal holding onto the metal next to it, and to actually rip an atom off of the, its neighbor requires energy. You are required to put some energy in. There is no free lunch. Uh, one of our goals with subtractive manufacturing is to uh, spend the least amount of energy. The less energy that we spend, the more efficient the process is and the better. Um, there are three major categories of subtractive man manufacturing uh, that kind of go from coarsest to finest. The coarsest being sawing, the middle being this, this general thing, machining. Machining actually has like a textbook definition when you get into it, and then past uh, machining you get to, to grinding or lapping. Um, sawing is when we're using uh, something to physically separate two chunks of material and we're left with two whole chunks of material at the end. The objective of sawing is to turn the least amount of material into powder or chips and fully have just two separate pieces at the end. So you're only splitting along a fault line. Uh, if you, you like chop a carrot with your knife, I think technically some textbooks would call that a sawing operation. Um, the problem with sawing, it's generally low precision. It's hard to uh, separate things into two whole chunks and have really good precision at the end of the day. Um, but it's extremely high efficiency, meaning you're, you're wasting the least amount of energy in, in separating molecular bonds you don't care about, and there's low material waste. So you go into any uh, professional setting, and almost always they're going to start with stock material, they're going to saw that stock material down, and then they're going to machine the least amount. Uh, you tend to want to remove as much material through sawing as possible, and then go to machining after that, because machining just fundamentally less efficient. Uh, so machining here, the middle ground option 
good precision to about a thousandth of an inch. That's about the most you can reasonably expect of most machining operations. Yes, it is possible to chase past that, but generally you're gonna be at a thousandth of an inch as the, the tightest tolerance you can hold on machining. It is medium efficiency and it's medium material waste. In machining, instead of uh, separating two chunks, we're now turning half of the material into chips. We are slicing it into a bunch of different little tiny segments but we're not ripping all of the molecules about. And what makes machining more efficient than grinding or lapping is that that is a chip that is a big solid chunk of all things still connected together. We didn't shred that individual chip up into tiny parts. That's what happens when you get into grinding and lapping. In grinding and lapping now, we can get to way higher pre pre precision, but it's horribly inefficient. Like if you want to grind an inch of steel off of something, Boy, howdy, are you gonna spend a lot of horsepower to do that? Yes, you can do that, but it's gonna be really expensive in both time and power to achieve that. So uh, there's the general like three tiers. I probably spent more time explaining that than necessary, but I really like the first thing that you should get sunk into your brain is machining is all about forming a good chip. A good chip is the entire purpose of machining and it's why machining kind of gets given its own category here. So. Uh, I'm gonna start off and show you guys this YouTube video, and this YouTube video is potentially the coolest YouTube video ever. And what's buck wild is that this was shot in like the 1960s with a, a scanning electron microscope and a TV camera pointed at the CRT screen of the scanning electron microscope. But this is what it looks like uh, in slow motion as machining actually happens. And this is what the cutting geometry of a machining cutting bit actually looks like as it cuts. And we'll talk a lot about the geometry here, but what we're trying to do is kind of slide this cutting edge through the material, take a chunk of that material, split the actual bonds at the smallest point here, and then bend that chip up and away from the material and rip it off to actually make our cut. Um, this is how all mills work. This is how all lathes work. This is how all shapers work. This is the fundamental essence of machining. And this is just so cool that you can actually see it and see what's going on here uh, in these videos. Like, I can't believe these videos were made. Buck wild that someone figured out how to do this. Uh, but what's really, really important about this is that by having that chip be a big, thick, solid piece of material, we're not breaking all of the bonds inside of the chip, which means fundamentally it requires less energy than grinding. What's also really important about this process is that our base material here is cold. Um, the chip heats up a ton when you're actually deforming it, both at the surface here where the cut is being ripped and in bending this chip up, a lot of heat is generated, but that heat doesn't have a huge amount of time to soak into the tool because that chip carries away from the tool bit and as the chip leaves, the chip takes the heat away with it. And so if you're not forming a good chip, uh, you get way, way, way more heat generated actually at the cutting point. And what you find in uh, machining, what is the actual limit? Oh, my, my slides look bad, sorry, I have to fix it. Now, good, now everything's back in the right shape. Uh, machining is all about making that chip good so that you don't get excess heat buildup so that the cutting is efficient. Um, this is the geometry of all of the angles that people talk about in an actual cut. And you'll find this diagram everywhere on the internet. And back in the day, uh, they used to really, really, really drill these angles into people that were learning how to machine because as you were learning how to machine, you were expected to take a blank piece of tool steel and walk up to a grinder and grind this geometry into that piece of tool steel. And that is how like most machinists up until like the 1980s were trained in this country uh, was you were going to go hand sharpen your tool at a grinding wheel um, to, to get a good uh, cut out of it. Nowadays, I would consider that almost useless knowledge and uh, machining has moved on significantly and is a lot better, but you will still be asked to know about some of these things. Uh, we're gonna go through this diagram just briefly and talk about some of these angles in some of these dimensions uh, so that you guys understand them. Uh, the first easiest angle to understand here, this one labeled alpha, alpha zero, uh, that's called your relief angle. 
It's the least important angle on all of these. You just need it to exist a little bit. If that angle isn't there at all, the bottom surface of your tool rubs along this whole edge and you just get a ton of extra heat that doesn't need to happen. So you need some amount of relief angle there uh, or clearance angle as they're calling it on this diagram. You'll also find all the machines have different names for all these things. Uh, so you have, to, you have to be careful when you talk to people. Uh, but relief angle, clearance angle, usually about three degrees is what most tools have built into them. The next angle here, gamma leaning back, that's your rake angle. Uh, the rake angle is really important because the rake angle determines a lot of the forces involved uh, in the cutting process. So, you know, if you're drilling with a drill bit, the drill bit tries to pull into the workpiece sometimes and acts like a screw and screws itself in. That's in part due to the rake angle at the geometry, uh, at the tip of the actual cutting edge. This tool is a positive rake angle tool, meaning that it is leaned back a little bit like that. The further back this is leaned, the more the tool will try to be drawn down into the cutting material. And you get sometimes very surprising cutting forces with the geometry of how the tip is ground. But generally, like when I bring a lathe tool into contact with like a brass or an aluminum, the rake angle on the tip of that lathe tool will actually try to pull the lathe tool deeper uh, into the cutting material due to that rake angle. They make tools with more severe rake angle uh, to control that draw in when you're, when you're trying to cut something like a stainless steel or a titanium that's really fighting you. You don't wanna have to force the tool in hard, so a higher rake angle, to angle tool will help you pull in more. Uh, they also make zero rake angle tools that are useful for things like plastics, um, where a uh, high rake angle can actually cause the, like, the, the work material to lift up and pull into the tool or you to get uh, all kinds of interesting effects when there's too much force generated from that angle there. Um, but typical tools like the average tool that you'll pick up will have somewhere around a five degree rake angle that will help pull it in. Um, in this diagram, and this is one of those like annoying coordinate frame things, they're showing cutting velocity over here as to the right. Um, uh, that will generally be referred to as your surface feet per minute. Uh, we talk about the cutting velocity in terms of the units we use to describe it, but that is how fast the tip of the tool is physically going across the material. And depending on which machining tool you use, this can be presented in different ways. On a lathe, the workpiece is spun and the tool is held fixed. On a mill, we spin the tool and the tool moves past the workpiece in the other direction. Uh, and again, like some of the tools are linear and cut straight, other tools are rotary. Uh, sometimes your, your cutting feet per minute depends on the diameter of the tool, sometimes it depends on the diameter of the workpiece, but the cutting velocity is important and we'll talk about it more. The final dimension that's important in here, A1, is your uncut chip thickness. Generally, no one talks about A2. I've never seen anyone mean A2 or A1, like it's whatever. Uh, a1 is how much each tooth is taking out of the material and is actually generally how thick of a chip will form. In machining, typically we never want A1 to be less than about a thousandth of an inch. If you try to make a chip thinner than a thousandth of an inch, it tends to split and grind instead of actually forming a good chip. Um, you can get to half a thousandth of an inch under the right circumstances, but when you get to a tenth of a thousandth of an inch, 0.0001, uh, you will never get a good chip to form. And you are now grinding instead of actually cutting chips. So a lot of the controls as we go into talking about speeds and feeds uh, throughout this are about making sure that that chip is being kept at at least a thousandth of an inch. Otherwise things get much, much worse. Uh, qu pause for questions on that diagram. Well understood? So like two and three thousandths is perfectly okay? Yes, um, and you can go much, much, much higher on bigger tools and bigger work pieces. Um, I have seen chips uh, thicker than like an eighth of an inch, um, but less than a thousandth of an inch, you're, you will have a problem. Like you're not really machining at that point. And that's for all materials? Uh, I will say this, I am generally almost always talking about metal in this class because uh, metal is what I have the most experience for. If you go and look up like machining, it's mostly about metal. Like that's 99% of industrial uses. There are some plastics out there that people machine, but the plastics are so easy to machine, we don't even think about it. Like it's like, it's like cutting through butter. Wood is its own weird art and wood has kind of some of its own interesting rules. 
generally I think the same thing applies, but in wood, like you're, you're often making dust anyway, because the wood doesn't form that same chip in the same way. But uh, on the shop bot, like for our wood CNC router here, I try to keep to about a thousandth of an inch feed per tooth as the, or chip thickness as the, the main metric still. So, so that, that makes sense, because sometimes when you're turning rotors, and you get, you know, on a brake lathe, and you get a rookie in there, and they're, you know, trying to do their final pass. And I've always been told, you always, you always want to do your final pass, but you want to grab at least a thousand yeah. on there. And some guys will just, you know, they'll just do it with a little smidge to do it. And you go, actually, we'll get a harmonic frequency. Like, it starts sounding like, you know, like, yep. uh, uh, you know, when you're spinning your finger on a, on a rim, on a glass, it makes this real high-pitched squeal. And it's a horrible cut, because I guess the rotor's actually vibrating back and forth in there. Yeah, and if you look at this video, I'm not, I don't think this is exactly apples to apples on it, but you'll see like they're taking a pretty small thing there. And instead of one continuous chip pulling up, you start getting these weird ripples forming where like okay. it pulls up a little bit and then kind of folds over on itself. And that extra like little lip at the tip there causes it. You actually, you'll get a worse surface finish um, where like the chip doesn't have enough structural integrity for the part of the chip up here to help pull up the material. Like when cutting is working correctly, the part of the chip that's actually above the cutting tip has enough strength that as it's being pushed up by that wedge, it's actually helping pull the cut along. Um, and so again, like when, when you try to cut too thin, you can get bad sounds, you can get bad surface finish, you'll get excess heat generation, generally bad. You really can, like a perfect tool with that's perfectly sharp, spinning at exactly the right speed, can get down below a thousandth of an inch, but like general machining recommendation, don't go below a thousandth if you absolutely don't have to. Um, yeah, and I'm not gonna talk about a spring pass, but we could also talk about a spring pass. Um, so, friction is the enemy, friction is hell, we hate friction. Um, friction is excess energy that we don't need to have happening in the cutting process. There is fundamentally some amount of energy that must be expended to rip those atomic bonds apart, and there is some amount of heat that will be created in the part no matter what. Like, by ripping that steel apart, heat will happen. That's fine, we'll deal with that, but any friction in the process actually hurts us. Um, going back to like looking at that diagram and thinking about that diagram, the geometry of the cutting tip does not rely on friction in any way. So what we actually want is as much lubrication as possible at the tip of that surface. And we achieve that with uh, coatings on the tip and with different types of cutting fluid and cutting lubricants. Um, when cutting metals, those will always, always, always help and you should always, always, always be using them. Um, there are a lot of specialty reasons for different coatings and a lot of different types of lubricants that can be added generally for like stuff we're doing around the makerspace a squirt of wd-40 will get the job done just fine it's not perfect but uh machining dry creates orders of magnitude more heat than than is needed like it is it is way 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 worse uh you will find lots of youtube videos of dry machining happening those only exist because they film better you go into any professional machine shop, you will never see a tool cutting dry. They were always oiled there, always covered in some kind of coolant, some, some different type of coolant system. Um, just generally, like, like rule of thumb one to get hard in your heads, friction bad. We, we do everything we can to reduce and minimize friction. Good? Okay. Uh, so we've been talking kind of in abstract about machining, but I do actually want to show some examples of what these machines look like if you're unfamiliar with at least the concepts of them. This is a CNC mill. Uh, this is insane. This is not a normal cut. This is at the absolute upper limits of what it's possible to do on a, on a CNC machine. That is hogging through uh, solid steel at a, at a ludicrous speed and depth of cut and, and feed. Like uh, This is probably a bad example to put in these slides, but it's so dang cool, I had to include it. Um, but uh, in this machine, just to talk about it while we have it here in front of us, the speed at which the tooth is moving through the material, the surface feet per minute by which the cut is actually occurring, is the radius of the tool times the RPM that the tool is spinning at. And the thickness of the chip is then a combination of how fast the tool is spinning 
and how fast the, the end mill is being moved to the side through the material. Uh, the faster that we move the thing to the side, the thicker each individual chip is. Um, does that make sense? Okay, we'll, co we'll come back to that geometry more, but that's just showing that's what a CNC mill looks like and generally what we're talking about when we say milling. Uh, we'll pop over to the next video, which is a lathe example. Lathes and mills are very, very similar, except in CNC lathes, the workpiece is spinning and the tool is held constant. Um, why do I, I just, I just, I'm, pick, I'm clicking the bad pieces. Yeah, 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 we know about your tool holder. <coughs> lathes have a uh, challenging problem in that the surface feet per minute that the tip of the tool is moving through the material is actually dependent upon the speed at which you're spinning your workpiece and the diameter of your workpiece. The outside edge of that part is spinning faster than the inside as they're cutting it. On a CNC lathe, they can actually dynamically speed up and slow down the machine as the tool goes deeper in it to keep it at exactly the right surface feet per minute. Uh, when you're operating the lathe, you don't have that luxury. And you might be at the correct speed on the outside edges of your part, but as you move towards the center and start cutting towards the center, you eventually reach zero speed at the center of the lathe, no matter what you do. And the, the smaller of a diameter of a workpiece that you try to uh, turn on the lathe, uh, the faster the lathe has to be able to spin, which starts to get pretty wild with it. Um, I will just address this debate briefly. Uh, you ask almost every machinist that's a professional, and lathing is not a word. You cannot lathe something. A lathe is a noun, and you turn something on a lathe. You ask most other people in the word world, and you can absolutely lathe something. Uh, I usually say turn, but I think you can lathe something. So yeah, that's yeah. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure you can. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm from that uh, ilk. <laughs> um, this then is just showing off, this is just really presenting the limits of where uh, modern technology is at with these machines. This is what is referred to as a five axis CNC machine. Um, and that just really refers to the number of directions it can tip and tilt the spinning bit at the end of it. In this case, this is a split axis machine where some of the degrees of freedom are on the workpiece moving the workpiece and some of the degrees of freedom are on the tool moving the tool around. Um, but it's able to move the tool in any orientation and, and direction at any time in absolutely cr crazy ways. And uh, we'll skip ahead in this video. This is made for a company that manufactures uh, motorcycle helmets and they're machining an entire motorcycle helmet from scratch out of a solid billet of aluminum. And it is ludicrously beautiful and ludicrously precise. And uh, you can imagine how complicated it is to program the tool paths for these machines to figure out where the machine can and can't cut and whether or not the shaft of the tool will collide with other parts of the metal as you stick the tool inside of the thing and reach to different areas. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, this video is 14 years old at this point and is the still the, the best CNC video I've ever seen. I basically think CNC machines got to this level and then everybody quit and switched to metal 3D printers, kind of past that. <laughs> like, they're like, okay, this is as insane as we can possibly engineer. By the way, that's transparent. Look, it, it, it milled a mesh there. Um, just ridiculous. But that's, that's really just to get you guys excited about machining and so you have some idea about the way that these add up on different machines as we actually talk about the physics a little bit more. So uh, the next section here, we've kind of talked about the like vague outside of the physics. We're actually now gonna very specifically talk about a topic in machining called speeds and feeds. And speeds and feeds is how you correctly set up a machine and a tool and a workpiece for getting a good cut. And the reality is, is you get different speeds and feeds depending on what machine you're using what tool you're using, and what type of material you're cutting. So it gets annoyingly messy. Uh, but our whole goal with getting the right speeds and feeds is to form a good chip without overloading the machine and without the workpiece or the tool getting too hot. If we do everything right, those three things come together and we don't get horrible failure. Um, as you're manually machining, it's pretty hard to screw up. Like if you're on a manual mill or a manual lathe, 
Uh, the machine will tell you when things are going wrong. It will sound different. It will feel different on the wheels. You will hear things different. Uh, you will smell the tool and the metal getting hot. Uh, and you have plenty of time to just slow down and stop. Great. On a CNC machine, you want to hit play and you want the machine to go for three hours without you having to check on it constantly and watch it, which means you have to get these right up front uh, so that that operation isn't going to fail 45 minutes into it when you have your back turned um, to it. And in the enclosure with like the coolant going and everything, way harder for you to tell that like heat's building up or that the, it's getting harder and harder to push through the material as the bit is getting dull or chips are welding to the bit. So um, yeah, sorry, lots of preamble. Um, we've already introduced these concepts, but we'll be talking about them in more detail now. So the, the two most critical parameters to getting speeds and feeds right are your surface feet per minute, how fast the tip of the tool is moving across the material, and the feed per tooth, how much material is being cut with each tooth or how thick a chip is going to be. Um, this is the uh, last kind of uh, machine I'm going to show you guys. Uh, this is the old school 1930s type of machine that existed before mills kind of uh, became standardized. Uh, this machine existed before we had really good ball bearings. Like these machines don't actually have ball bearings in them, which is buck wild. Um, but this is called a shaper. And what's really just nice about this is this is the simplest possible case for speeds and feeds. You can see the speed is exactly how fast it's being pushed for there. And this machine literally, as it goes back, there's a wheel that kicks over and it moves over. Like in this case, I think that's a 30,000th of an inch thick chip that it's taking right there. And it's just, it's a perfect example of the machining process that you can see really clearly in front of you. But uh, for a end mill, the formula for surface feet per minute is uh, uh, speed of the tool times the circumference of the tool is your surface feet per minute. Or speed of the tool times two pi radius uh, is your surface feet per minute. Um, generally, target values are for aluminum between 200 and 300 feet per minute, and for steel between 500 and 100 feet per minute. Um, steel, you want to cut slower and kind of with more force. Aluminum likes to be cut more quickly. But in general, I don't just trust one value of these. I uh, do I? I'm going to get my slides uh, out of thing. Sorry. Quick audible. Quick audible. I'm going to a different location. I almost always go to uh, this link. Uh, no, dang it. I'm going to copy this into my slides right now. Uh, you can go in and you can look up different charts for these. For different materials that you're cutting, what is a good speed and feed for that material? You will also find that there are different numbers for this for uh, different types of cutting bits, whether you're cutting with high-speed steel or carbide. But I wanted to provide a few more examples there. Sorry, audible. And I'm thinking with stainless steel, it's going to be even slower than steel. Um, not a whole lot. Let me, uh, let me check one of these diagrams. No, nope, that's feed per tooth. SFM for stainless. Don't see a lot of people providing good recommendations. Um, yeah. We could Google a little bit more and probably find some. Oh, here's, yeah. So I think this is the problem which is uh, these are all just different types of stainless steel. Okay. And you see speed recommendations ranging all over the place for it. So it, uh, I think it, I get, it looks like on stainless steel, it depends a lot on the specific stainless yep. you have and how hardened it is. Okay. Um, and generally, like every time I need to know, I do exactly what I just did right there, which is Google it and you will find charts of it. There's also the classic machinist's handbook, which is in every single machine shop. Ours is back there, has tables of it. Um, but, sorry, next major dimension, feed per tooth. Uh, feed per tooth for a mill is complicated uh, because you care about the cutting speed, the spindle speed, and the feed that's actually going on in the different shafts. You put those all into a formula, 
and you finally get the feed per tooth spit out at the very end. Uh, I don't think you should ever think about this formula, because uh, when you're doing it by hand, it's pretty easy to figure out by hand what, if, what about the right feed is. Uh, once you spend a little time machining, you'll just develop a feel for it of like, hey, that's a pretty normal feed per tooth for this size of tool of this size of RPM with this material. The other thing is when you're in Fusion 360 and you're programming this, Fusion 360 calculates feed per tooth for you and shows you the feed per tooth as you're plugging in. You tell it I'm using this tool and I'm using this spindle speed, it'll tell you you'll get this feed per tooth at this inches per minute and does all the math for you so you don't have to think about it. But know that the feed per tooth you get on, an in, on a mill depends both on the spindle speed, the diameter of the tool, and how fast the machine is feeding in terms of like x-axis movement. Um, bigger tools need to be fed faster uh, to get the same feed per tooth at the, at the same spindle speed. So yeah, anything. Bigger for bigger tools. Uh, there is a really, really good PDF here, um, which I recommend you guys grabbing if you ever actually want to do these calculations by hand. It has all of the calculations we're gonna talk about today in one table with one common set of definitions of what each of those different terms are and how to calculate everything. Um, so f throughout the rest of this, like I'll be showing more equations, showing more things to talk about. If you're ever wanting to do it by hand, I recommend finding this PDF and printing this off and having it with you, uh, just so you have all the equations in one place. Um, yes, sensible starting feeds for diameters under uh, half an inch range from 0 0.002 to 0 0.002. So two tenths to two thousandths of an inch for mills under half of an inch in diameter, for mills over half of an inch diameter, starting at two thousandths of an inch and going to 003. There, 0002 here, you're in this weird realm of micro-machining when you start using really tiny bits and you can get chips to form well at those speeds, but you gotta take, you got, everything's gotta be dialed just perfectly. We'll talk about runout a little later on and, and what runout is and why it matters horribly, but actually getting a good chip to form that low Fuck wildly hard. Um, I did. Sh I showed you the PDF. The other version of it is to go to this link, um, and there is a really good uh, set of online calculators to calculate all these things. Ah, that's why I don't have it in my slides because the table's here in the calculator. I, I, I remember now. Sorry, that's bad prepping on my part. But uh, really good calculator. You can plug everything in. Just to quickly show, we have a. Let's say we have a quarter inch cutter in diameter. We'd like to cut aluminum, and let's say we want to cut our aluminum at 250 surface feet per minute. It's telling us we would want to use around 4,000 RPM on our spindle speed. So now, with 4,000 uh, as our RPM, wanting to get a 2,000th of an inch feed per tooth on it, and with a two flute cutter, that means this cutter has two teeth per revolution of it. If we hit calculate again, It'll tell us 15.3 here. I hate that there's not units on that. That's inches per minute. Don't ask me why we use all these dumb units and it's, surf, it's feet per minute over here and inches per minute over there. But feed rates for machines are always given in inches per minute in this horrible, horrible country. 15.3 um, is, is very normal. Thing to call out, like the exact same diameter of cutter, but with four feet teeth on it, which is very common. Like almost all of the cutters we have back there, we have a two flute and four flute version of it. You'd need to feed that same cutter in at twice the rate, just because it has four uh, teeth instead of two teeth on it to get this, the same correct feed per tooth on it. You're talking about the bed speed. Yes, the, the speed, the X axis would be, one of the axes of the machine would be moving there. Yeah. And that's because in one revolution, like four of those teeth are going to pass. Each one of those teeth needs to be given two thousandths. So for each time it goes through one revolution, you have to feed two thousandths in for each tooth on it. Uh, there are one tooth cutters as well. I'll show some pictures of those a little later. But uh, when you get the surface feet per minute, right, and you get the feed per tooth, right, you form a good chip and cutting is happy. Those are really easy really sane and just kind of no nonsense. Like I'm using this diameter cutter in this type of material, there will be a speed and feed that you should use for it. And it's not that hard to figure out what's going on. The hard part, what almost everybody screws up and what almost everybody struggles with the most learning the CNC machines here is now the next part that goes along with that, which is your material removal rate. 
So a given cutter and a given machine have a horsepower limit that those uh, tools and that machine are capable of. For the actual machine, the machine has a spindle in it. The spindle motor is what's actually doing the cutting work, and that spindle motor will be rated at some amount. The spindle on the ShopBot, I think, is uh, just over a horsepower. The spindle on the Tormach is like one and a quarter horsepower. If you try to remove more material than in, in a given amount of time than one horsepower can turn into chips, you will have overloaded that machine, the spindle will bog down, uh, it will not be able to keep spinning at the speed it needs to spin, terrible, terrible crash will happen, bad thing will happen. So you cannot exceed the horsepower that you ask of the machine. Secondly, you also can't really ex exceed the horsepower asked of the tool. Um, if I try to remove like 10 cubic inches a minute of steel with like an eighth inch little tiny cutter, I will melt that cutter. Um, it just can't handle that much material removal rate. Doesn't matter if the speeds and feeds add up. Bigger cutters can handle more horsepower, like more power and speed can be transmitted through a bigger cutter. Um, so you need to get these things right. Um, so what's the consequence of going too slow? Uh, oh, okay, this is where it gets really subtle here. Uh, if you go too slow in your feeds and speeds from the previous part here, you generate a bunch of extra heat, you dull your cutter really fast, and you can still have terrible thermal runaway problems. So you've got a surface feed per minute that is fixed, like we have to feed into the material at this speed and the cutter must be spinning at this speed. How do we control our material removal rate then? We control it by changing our width of cut and depth of cut. You don't control it by speeding up or slowing down the machine. That's, I think, one of the most counterintuitive parts of learning how to operate CNC machines. If you slow down the machine, you're like, the machine's feeding in. Oh, it's feeding in too hard. If you slow the machine down by half, you just made your chip half as thick. And it actually can mean, like, you're now taking twice as many cuts. You're generating the same amount of heat now in less volume of space. You're, getting, you're actually generating more heat in the same area when you slow the machine down. So one of the ways that a lot of people get into trouble particularly when they're starting to machine, is they're like, oh crap, I'm overloading the machine. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna slow down. And that actually makes things worse most of the time. What you wanna do if you want to put less load on the machine is you wanna take more passes. You wanna take more cuts. You either want to reduce your radial depth of cut and kind of skim along the side or reduce your axial depth of cut and do more passes at, at more depths. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm actually gonna go back a slide um, and I'm gonna uh, pull out this online calculator so that you guys can kind of so see. It's, it's the cutting area that's important, right? Yes, the cutting area is how we control uh, material removal rate. And that's really because our RPM and our f inches per minute are fixed from the tool that we're using and the material that we're using. The only thing that we have to kind of control horsepower then is our width of cut and depth of cut. Uh, online calculators here for cutting diameter that at the end of the day will spit out um, the, uh, the, uh, the power. It will spit out, spit out the power um, that it's coming out of this. Online calculator is actually not that interesting, but uh, what I did want to talk about now is this crazy, crazy table and this crazy, crazy chart. So. Uh, People have done studies, they've done a lot of math, and they came up with this wonderful, wonderful table which magically solves all of your units problems. But if you have a width of cut in inches, a depth of cut in inches, and a feed rate in inches per minute, and you multiply it by this magical K value from this table, it spits out a number in horsepower. That's how many horsepower that cut's gonna require. That's remarkably easy. That's remarkably simple, yeah, because old machinists back in the day, they weren't gonna do a lot of hard math. Um, so this is a really easy way to do it, and the answers are actually very, very accurate. Um, generally, for like the machines here, we're not a production machine shop. We're not trying to maximize like getting every single ounce out of these machines. I recommend not going over 25% of what those machines are rated for, and the machines will be very happy and last very long, and you've got some tolerance to screw up. So like if you run the math on one of these numbers and it comes out more than a quarter horsepower, you should probably take more passes. 
Um, you also won't get a quarter horsepower out of a tool smaller than like a half inch tool. Um, exactly what horsepower you can get out of what tool under what circumstances, ah, machines and art, get some practice at it, break some tools. Uh, other thing to take away from this chart that I think is really uh, important, aluminum right here, aluminum and magnesium and copper, brass, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, very easy to machine. Highly, highly, highly recommend starting with aluminum as a great, cheap, easy material to learn how to machine on. Uh, wood is, I've seen this, these values for wood on some different parts, like balsa wood starts at 0 0.0001, uh, like black walnut gets up to like 0.2. Um, so like there are, there are woods up there that get up to like a decent amount of work to remove, but you, you, yeah, nothing too crazy. There are plastics that go up to like 0.3 when you're talking about like UMHW and some, some tougher plastics. Uh, but aluminum at 0.3, we go over here to like titanium and uh, high tensile steel, literally 10 times harder, 10 times as much energy uh, to, to cut uh, tougher, stronger steels with it. Um, steel covers a annoyingly wide range of difficulty to machine depending on how hardened the steel is. Same thing with cast iron, like cast iron can all, be all the way from 0.7 to 1.7 just depending on quite how that cast iron has been heat treated. Um, so be aware of like what material you're cutting and like you can be off by a factor of two on these just if like, hey, you thought that was uh, one type of steel and it's another type of steel uh, can, can get you pretty bad. Questions there? Cool. Uh, oh, hey, I have the actual numbers here, yep. Um, Tormox uh, 440 is a three quarter horsepower which means in aluminum, the absolute maximum it can do is two and a quarter cubic inches of aluminum per minute would be the maximum you could remove with that machine um, if you have the right cutter in it. Uh, the, oh yeah, the ShopBot's spindle motor claims to be five horsepower on the Alibaba page that it was bought from. It's not, um, it's like 1.2 horsepower. Um, yeah, and then the, the bridge port, which is back there, one and a half horsepower, giving you, you know, four cubic inches. Uh, never, never, never go past these numbers. It will immediately completely fail if you try to. 25% is safe, ha healthy and safe. I didn't know I had a whole slide that told me all of that. So um, this entire class, this entire intro can be distilled to these two thou shalt's. This is how you do speeds and feeds correctly. You shall keep the spindle speed and feed rate in balance so that a good chip is formed and materials cut near its ideal surface feet per minute. Uh, near its ideal surface feet per minute, plus or minus like 25% is fine. If you look up a table for aluminum, they'll say between 200 and 50 and 300. You can cut aluminum absolutely fine at 200 and absolutely fine at 400. You've got some tolerance there. You don't wanna be off by a factor of four though. Like if you try to cut aluminum at like 75 surface feet per minute, it will get mad at you. It will, it will produce bad surface finishes. It will chunk and fight and be angry. Um, once you have your, your spindle speed and your feed rate set correctly so that you will form a good tooth, you will then adjust depth of cut and width of cut to not require more machine power than the machine and tool are capable of. If you get those right, you're gonna be in really, really, really good shape. Now, why do people hate this and why do people screw this up a lot? The depth of cut and width of cut are set by the G-code you generate from your, for your CNC machine, meaning you're over here in Fusion 360, you generate your depth of cut and width of cut, you put them on your USB, you walk over to your machine, you hit play, you no longer have control of depth of cut or width of cut. You have to go back to Fusion 360 and change your program to change those on the machine. But while you're standing there at the machine, it gives you a big slider to speed up and slow down the machine. Because while the machine is interpreting the G-code, it can scale the speeds and feeds up and down a little bit. So while you're standing there, it gives you knobs to not do the thou shalt's that I said here. What I will say is you can absolutely speed up and slow down the machine with the little knobs on it within a reasonable range. You can go 30% slower, 30% faster, and probably be completely fine. If you start going 50% of the speed that you programmed, almost certainly now you're gonna start getting into trouble with your chip size. It matters less if you're using a huge tool and taking giant cuts and you were like at 3,000th of an inch feed per tooth to start with, like you've got more tolerance there and can slow down more. 
But generally, where people get into trouble is they're too lazy to go back to the Fusion 360 and regenerate their G-code, and they just keep twiddling with the knob on the machine, and it gets into thermal runaway, and they're like, oh, why did this bit break on me? Well, you slowed it down too much, you stopped forming a good chip, everything heated up in a hurry. Good? My thou shouts? Okay. Part two, all about bits. Uh, there's a lot of types of end mills. These are what the cutting tools that are used in a milling machine look like. Generally, people will just say end mill, and end mill, they're really usually talking about a flat end mill. Good thing to know, there is no perfectly flat end mill that you can buy on the market. Um, this corner there will never be perfectly 90 degrees, and almost all of them have some little tiny radius in them, even if it's like a thousandth of an inch. Uh, they will still say it on the on the manual because if you try to put it there at 90 degrees, it breaks off and chips almost almost immediately. So also, uh, don't piss off machinists by designing interior perfect 90 degrees. You can't manufacture them anyway, even if even if you try. Um, the different shapes of these are all designed for uh, different types of material removal rate, different types of finishes, different types of contours. Ball end mills are really common when you're trying to do something like a 3D contour map and you're actually texturing over the surface. Like that whole bike helmet was probably done with ball end mills because ball end mills best cover up the like steppedness of doing things in multiple passes and, and round things out. There's lots of specialty end mills with weird uh, shapes at the end for cutting things like chamfers. Um, and, and, you know, rounded edges on the outside of parts. Uh, lots of cool geometry there. Um, one of the most important things to learn immediately with end mills is that there are center cutting and non-center cutting end mills. And nine times out of ten, if you pick up a random end mill off of a shelf, it is going to be a non-center cutting end mill. What that means is, is that the teeth do not go all of the way to the center of the axis of where the tool cuts. And that means you cannot drill a hole with an end mill. Like nine times out of 10, you pick one up. If you try to drill a hole with it, there is no cutting teeth in the center that will cut that material right at the, at the center. Fusion 360 solves this for you automatically if you don't tell it anything. It just assumes all end mills are non-center cutting and it produces a helical path where the end mill, instead of just going straight into the material, will spiral down anytime it's plunging an end mill into material so that that spiral ramp gives the outside edges time to cut space for the center part of the end mill that's not cutting. Does that make sense? Okay, there are specialty bits that you can buy that are center cutting. They are more expensive. Nobody wastes money on them. Never, never assume an end mill is center cutting uh, if you don't know. Assume they are not center cutting and do not drill holes with them. So, so the mill can move diagonally? Uh, the CNC ones, absolutely. A manual one, yes, if you turn the handles at the same time, which is really hard to do. So would not recommend it. There are ways that you can do diagonal cuts on uh, manual mills in different ways, but generally what you do is you either tilt the workpiece or you can actually tilt the entire head of the machine uh, to, get, to get cuts made at angles. Did that answer the question? Well, does it, does it tip the head or does it, does it actually go? A CNC machine will actually go at, it, go at spiral at angles, yeah. So like the, the bit will remain straight up and down, but it will then spiral the bit around in a path. I have a video of that. And that later. clears the chip. Yeah. It seems like the center would still impact the object. At the right, at the right angle, um, it'll be good. Um, e even if there's nothing in the center. Yeah. So, so you can spiral big enough so that part of it will always have cut the part that the center will go through. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, flute um angle is another thing that uh, can be different on different end mills. Um, generally, this is a woodworking. Uh, concept more. Uh, to actually be an end mill, no flutes are required. This is a completely valid end mill and will work absolutely fine. The cutting geometry that we're talking about is actually at that edge. The flute is not part of the cutting geometry. Like the flute is not what makes the end mill cut or not. The flutes exist solely for chip clearance. The job of the flute is to get the chip out and away of where the cutting is happening so that you're not recutting the chip in the next pass. 
generally like nine out of 10 uh, bits that you will find will be a spiral up cut bit where their job is to lift the chips up out of where they're cutting. Um, that's pretty much always what will be used in metal. In wood, however, wood does this nasty thing called tear out where uh, the flutes can cause terrible surface finish problems right at the edges of the material. Where instead of cutting, it rips out that last chunk of wood. You can prevent that by having the flutes pulling into the rest of the material instead of ever pushing out. So if you have a spiral upcut bit and you're cutting a piece of wood with like a laminate on it that you want to protect that veneer, uh, you almost always put the veneer on the bottom and cut through the bottom of the piece to have the spiral upcut pushing up into the wood. Or you can spend money on a spiral downcut bit, which will do the same thing for you, but actually makes the chip clearance way, way worse. Or they make these really fancy, funky comp compression bits that spiral down on the top and spiral up at the bottom. Really, like, the only people buying those are, like, Ikea, when Ikea's manufacturing furniture so that in one pass you can, you can have... But then where do the chips go? Uh, out the side, generally. So uh, chip clearance usually is not a problem if you're taking an outside edge cut. If you're not... Chip clearance really becomes a problem when you try to slot and, like, dig a trench through the material. Yeah. You would have a hard time with a compression bit like this slotting. Okay. Um, this is a fly cutter. This is what I was talking about earlier for a one-toothed cutter. Um, fly cutters are really cool because you can buy one fly cutter like this, put a high-speed steel piece in it, and you can extend that piece of steel in or out to get any diameter of cutter that you would like. What fly cutters are generally used for is getting really, really, really good surface finishes and really, really, really flat surface finishes. Um, so like a very common thing to do with a fly cutter is deck an engine block where you have like an eight inch wide surface and you want to get the entire eight inches flat. Well, the way that you can do that really well is with an eight inch fly cutter um, set up. So in one pass, you flatten the entire deck of the block without any moving the machine in the other axes that could introduce other types of error. Um, that only works if your fly cutter is extremely level. If the head of your machine isn't perfectly perpendicular to the bed, your fly cutter, instead of cutting flat, cuts an elliptic kind of dish into it, it'll be lower in the middle instead of it, and higher at the edges. Uh, happens a lot when the heads of the machines are out of tram. So a fly cutter is not for a rough cut, it's for a final pass. Generally, it's most used for, for finished passes, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, with, with these giant fly cutters, like you'll often run these at like 30 RPM or 40 RPM, because it's like an eight inch diameter cutter, and that will give you the right surface feet per minute. But um, the, the surface feet per minute recommendations also get slightly wild when you're actually chasing like perfect surface finishes. Uh, people will often go like double or triple the recommended surface feet per minute when you're just doing the finishing pass um, because for, for reasons that can make things smoother. Um, but yeah, uh, you know what? We're going to, I like audible, so let's do another audible. Are you going to talk about all end mills? Not much. Not past what I, what I really said. Well, I have a question about um, using a ball end mill to finish. Yep. Aren't, aren't the chips kind of triangle shaped and is that a problem? Going less than a thousand something an inch to get a smooth seat? Um. Yes, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, the, the going less than a thousandth of an inch is a rule that you can violate on finish passes, which is generally when you're using a ball end mill. Um, where the thousandth of an inch really matters is when you're removing material. Like, the more material you're removing, the more important it is to be in the correct speeds and feed zones, because the more material you're removing, the more heat there is involved in general in the whole process. Um, so right at the tip, or like at the root of the ball end mill, the ball end mill will be cutting at the wrong speed. The sides of the ball end mill will still cut at the correct speed. Um, the the gen Generally what I see people doing when they're doing like finishing passing with the very tip of the ball end mill, uh, they'll be running at an average speed where like the, the, a third of the diameter of the tool will be in the correct speeds and feeds. The outside edges might be a little too fast. You know, instead of being like, if you got a, like a pretty much flat surface, do you want to tip the end mill? So it's like cutting more on the side rather than on the, like in the center. 
Gener here, let me let me show you a video of like fall in mill contouring. Generally, but when you're coming in with a ball end mill, you're doing it as a finishing pass. Like they roughed out the vast majority of this material with a different cutter. Mm -hmm. And then they're coming back with the ball end mill just to get this beautiful, perfect shape on it. Where the ball end mill helps take out all the wobbles and waves um, that would have been left using a straight cutter. Like they'll use a straight cutter to remove as much of the material as possible and then come back with the ball cutter for the final pass. Does that make sense? Does that track? Yeah. That's just beautiful. Yeah. The only real reason to use a ball cutter is when you are trying to uh, do crazy 3D things where like the, the that, that last bit of geometry will really matter a lot. Um, last kind of video I'm gonna show here, uh, thread milling is a really cool thing you can do with a specialty cutter. So this is another cutter with a specialty shape on it. The particular shape of this one is such that it matches the tooth of a thread on a bolt. And he's actually going to mill the threads of a bolt into the outside of this That's piece cheap. by spiraling around it uh, on a mill. And if, if anyone ever tells you like, you know, mills can't make round parts, mills can't do what lathes can do. Absolutely they can if you just buy enough cutters. Um, the reality is, is there's almost nothing that you can't make on a mill that like you could make on a lathe if you're willing to spend enough on buying the right tools for the mill. The problem is like every different kind of weird shape of thing that you want to do on the mill here, you have to buy a weird specialty shaped cutter for. Um, and like one of these cutters can be like 20 or 30 bucks. Um, so lathes are more versatile, but um, isn't that, that's, that's, that's a very easy way to make some cool threads. Um, and thread milling like this happens a lot for very, very big threads. Like, like when you're talking about like more than a foot in diameter, uh, that stuff's hard to do on a lathe. You absolutely can do it on a lathe, but uh, thread milling uh, often becomes the easiest way at that point. So, uh, Other types of mills that exist, these are uh, uh, face mills. Um, face mills are very similar to fly cutters, but use carbide inserts. Uh, go, no, I want my slideshow back. Uh, they use carbide inserts instead of using a uh, high-speed steel um, like ground bit in it. Um, face mills, I think, are taking over more and more and more from what fly cutters were being used for. Um, and this is, again, kind of the modern age of machining. The modern age of machining is you buy carbide tooling with these perfectly manufactured cutting edges built into them. You use them, they wear out, you flip it around, you use the other edge, you throw it away, you buy another one. Um, these carbide inserts right now are like 15 cents a piece. Um, and they are such a better edge than you can get out of high-speed steel. So the general way everything is going more and more these days is more and more carbide insert tooling, less and less high-speed steel tooling. 37%, you'd have to increase your feed rate by five-fold. Uh, you can, yeah, you can need to. Carbide likes to run faster than high-speed steel, so almost always you want to cut faster with carbide. Um, but again, it's a, it's a balance. Um, carbide is almost always able to remove more material per minute. But in comparison than, to a fly cutter. What? In comparison to a fly cutter, because you're saying if you have five blades. Oh, um, um, in, in this particular example, yes. Uh, do, what you can also do, you can remove four of these if you want to and, oh. and, make, and make it one tooth. It'll, it'll cut just fine with, with four of them removed, um, which is one of the other cool things. Um, usually, I, it's weird to see one with five. I see a lot more with like multiples of two because you can leave it symmetric and, and have it in balance, in balance still um, when you remove them. The biggest problem with these is I have yet to see someone who has a good design for a face mill that lets you change the diameter on it. The nice thing with a fly cutter is you can just slide that um, high speed steel piece in and out to get different uh, diameters from it. Face mills, like one of these will be like 80 bucks um, and uh, you get one, one size then and hopefully it's the size you want. Um, we're going to talk about tool holders now uh, for probably too long because there's a lot of detail that goes into it. Um, but how you hold your tool in uh, a mill matters an enormous amount because it's subjected to way higher forces than uh, like a drilling operation produces into the tool. And it is incredibly, incredibly important that that tool is perfectly concentric on the axis. We'll talk about that a little bit more detail in just a second. So 
Uh, the tool holders on the left here, these are called ER20 collets. ER20 is just kind of the size and style of these. I would say these are the most common uh, sized collets for all small CNC machines and routers, uh, pretty much universally right now, European and US. Uh, these cutter, these tool holders, or specifically these collets, are basically complicated leaf springs. All these little slots in them make them turn into just like one giant sprung element. And the way that these work is that these go into a tool into a tool holder, which is this thing over here. This nut actually screws over the top of this collet. Um, the nut pushes onto this flange of it as a taper here. And then this back taper matches a taper inside of the tool holder or inside of the machine. And as the, you tighten this, it forces that collet up and all these individual leaves close and clamp on the tool, providing a huge amount of holding force perfectly symmetrically around it. Works really, really well. Uh, one problem being if you use these on the wood router, uh, a bunch of sawdust gets packed in those little leaves um, and chips can get packed in here. And if there is a chip packed in there that prevents one of these leaves from closing the right amount, you can get weird asymmetric forces and they don't close correctly and you get all kinds of offsets. So these need to be really clean uh, when you clamp them. Uh, these in the top right, these are R8 collets. These are what are used in the Bridgeport and in the Tormach. Um, these uh, are the same principle where it's a leaf spring. Each of these have kind of three leaves in them. At the bottom of these is a threaded hole. And the way that these machines work is that your tool goes in here. There's a thing called a drawbar that goes all the way through the spindle of the machine, threads into the bottom of that. As you tighten the drawbar, it pulls it up into the machine. The taper surface is there, press into the machine, and close and clamp on it. Um, almost every machine's, the actual spindle of the machine has a taper that is built into it. That taper is your like critical reference surface. He's got an R8 collet that they're passing around so you can see what one of those collets actually looks like. All, all of these exist, all of these matter because of how incredibly important concentricity and runout are on getting a good cut. So earlier we talked about that like normal uh, feed per tooth is a thousandth of an inch. That means if your tool is off axis at the tip by a thousandth of an inch, you're having a horrible, horrible day. What'll happen if your run out is a thousandth of an inch at the tip of the tool, one tooth will cut nothing, the next tooth will cut two thousandth of an inch. The next cut will cut, tooth will cut nothing, the next cut will cut two thousandths of an inch. You will get horrible vibration, your tool will break, and you'll have no idea why, and you won't know what's going on, and it's because you've got some off axis, some angle, some eccentricity that has been introduced somewhere in your stack. Um, typical specifications for like the tolerances on these tapers inside these machines are perfectly axially correct to within one ten thousandth of an inch um, over the whole ground surface of the thing. They are incredibly, incredibly precise, both in the manufacturing of the spindle of the machine that creates that taper and in the collets that hold the tool. Um, that's why you can't just grab a drill truck, put a drill truck on the, on the mill, put an end mill in the drill truck and cut correctly. You will have terrible, terrible run out. Um, it is good to, I will not cover it today, learn how to put a dial indicator on the machine and actually measure the run out of the tool. Um, if you're having ch uh, tools just break on you randomly, you should check it. But that's why tool holders are important. Um, how am I doing on time? God, I'm, I bloviate a lot, but we're going to make it. We're, we're going to get through it. Uh, 22 minutes left. Yeah, we'll be okay. Um, work holding is the next kind of major topic here and probably the most important one from like a hobbyist learning how to do it and a safety standpoint. Uh, end mills can break. Like they will shatter on you. When you do, parts of those end mills will go flying off. If you calculate how fast the tip is moving, they can come flying off at, you know, hundreds of feet per minute of speed. That's, that's a lot, it can hurt you. It will not puncture your body like a bullet, like you're not gonna get killed from an in-mill breaking and a chip of the in-mill flying at you. What it will do is it will take out your eye, um, which is why safety glasses are just the universal expectation anytime uh, one of these machines is running for anybody in the room or parent area. Like statistically by a ludicrous amount, it's the most common injury that comes from these machines is chips or uh, in mills being thrown at you. But setting that aside, sorry, that was a, that was a tangent. Uh, the way that people really get hurt on, the, hurt on these machines uh, is the workpiece coming loose and the workpiece being thrown out of the machine. 
Uh, when the clamp's holding the workpiece let go and the machine picks up and tosses the workpiece, we're now not talking about like a 10 gram chip of the thing. We're now talking about a 10 pound chunk of steel and damn sure that machine has enough power to accelerate it up to the same speed before it launches it off. Um, I have seen like two inch deep dents in like eighth inch sheet metal from chunks of steel hitting the inside of some of the enclosures on CNC machines. Like these things get picked up and thrown when they come loose. So it's one of those like no no's, like there is no if, ands, or buts, you have to clamp your work well enough that it's not coming loose. And general rule of thumb, like the Tormach and the Bridgeport, the maximum machining forces that those machines are capable of producing around a thousand pounds. So you better have enough clamping, holding on to whatever you're doing to be able to withstand about a thousand pounds if you're gonna push that machine to its limits. Don't skimp on clamps. Don't use wood shop clamps. Like, uh, no, secure the crap out of that machine. Uh, there are uh, equations that people exist for calculating max force. Don't ask me where magic number come from, but uh, yeah, you ba basically for the radius of tool that you're using, the spindle speed you're running at, and the horsepower of your machine, this is the max force that you would expect that machine to be able to produce as a reaction force on it. Um, but typically, like, you should be thinking about a thousand pounds um, when you're clamping something in, in place. Um, machinists have to do this a lot, so they've come up with an inordinate number of ways of doing it that are really, really complicated, but your best friend are these milling vices down here. These are the, the bee's knees when it comes to making it easy. They are easily capable of clamping with several thousand pounds of force so that your part's not gonna go anywhere, but you still have to use them correctly and make sure there's enough bite on them. But no, there is a whole world of different vices and styles of vices out there that people use. I will say you won't tend to get into a lot of trouble using a vice because vices are pretty obvious on how to use them. Where people do get into trouble is the most common, uh, the other most common way that machinists hold things down are with these weird things called hold down clamps or machinists clamps or tool clamps. People call them a lot of names, but it's this interesting kind of erector set Lego system where these nuts that fit into the T-slots of the machines, there's these blocks that provide standoffs and there's these uh, little toes then that are able to grab your piece you clamp down a nut into, uh, you clamp down a stud with a nut into the toe nut, and it makes a little lever here um, that gives you some force amplification and lets you squeeze down on your part. You can absolutely produce thousands of pounds of clamping force with these. You can also absolutely set them up wrong and have no holding force at ever, and you will find no one in the world that will tell you a torque spec for how tight you should tighten that nut. Um, the answer is good and tight. Uh, and the machinists who know what they're doing develop a feel for it. But as you're getting started, like you should never ask yourself, should I need another clamp? You should ask yourself, can I fit another clamp um, and go to town? Because seriously, one of these parts breaking loose on you, no fun, no good. Um, and there's lots of like these, I don't know if you guys can see it pretty well, but there's weird teeth that go here and I've had a lot of different machinists tell me a lot of different things about what you are and aren't supposed to do with those teeth and how. And you find pictures of, on the internet of people doing stuff like that and you look at it and you go, that's not what they told me. I don't know. Everybody seems to use these damn things differently and most of them still have their fingers, so probably works well. Okay, last major thing that we're going to talk about now, and this is where the art of machining comes back in, and I'm sorry because it's a crap show, but there's this horrible, horrible thing that can happen when you're doing any kind of machining operation, be it on the lathe or on the mill, and it's called chatter. And what chatter is, is you find a resonant frequency, either of your workpiece or of the end mill that you are using, that causes it to start oscillating at a frequency that is reinforced by the motion of the machine. Um, you can imagine if I try to machine a thin plate where I've like supported the thin plate in the middle, but there's hangout over here, that thin plate can start ringing up and down at some frequency and chattering in and out. And at the right combination of feeds and speeds on the machine, I will hit the resonant frequency of that plate and it will build and build and build. Um, or just in a pocket like this where I'm just normally machining in like a perfectly stiff piece of steel, every single tool, regardless of the shape of that tool, has some frequency I wish that tool will get unhappy and start chattering around with just the tool itself 
hitting a resonant frequency of the shape of the tool. So it's weird, it's unpredictable, it's a combination of how much you're asking the machine to do and the particular speeds and feeds that you end up running at. Um, but when it happens, you not only get horrible surface finish, uh, but you wear out your tool really fast and you tend to break bits because this does the same thing as having run out in your uh, holder does. Uh, it causes inconsistent uh, loads on the machine and just causes stuff to, to shake apart. Uh, this is a really cool example of someone having done the exact same pass at the exact same feed rate, but every single one of these was done at a different RPM of the spindle speed as he went across it. And you can see different chatter patterns appear, like this is starting to chatter a little bit right here, then it goes away and then it comes back and then it actually ends up going away again. Um, that is what chatter behaves like, uh, where when chatter is happening, often going either faster or slower can solve it. Um, and what tends to be going on is this, according to manufacturers of crazy software, um, how this is solved on real professional CNC machines these days is they have like microphones or uh, what's, a, what's a microphone? A, they have strain gauges built into the tools where they're measuring the deflection of the tool as it's running. They detect that chatter is happening and automatically speed up or slow down the spindle to find the sweet spot as the machine is running. Like that's what modern CNC machines do nowadays. We're not gonna be doing that, but all they're trying to do is like, they're trying to run their machine at absolutely the limits of the amount of material it can run. And so they're trying to find these peaks and be able to like jump from this peak to that peak without crossing the trough in the middle where they get horrible chatter. For us at a makerspace on hobbyist machines that we're learning on, you should be over here. You should be in the middle of the normal blue zone and nowhere near these weird peaks where going faster will help you. When you really know what you're doing and you're making a part and you're gonna make 10 of them and like each one's eight hours, yeah, you can start optimizing your tool paths and saving a bunch of time. In reality, as you're starting out on the machines, it's way better for the thing to take four times as long on the machine and just work than to try to push it and get an inconsistent result out. This is why I say like less than 25% load. If you're less than 25% load, you're way down over here in, in happy zone land and just not pushing things terribly hard. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, we've been talking about milling a lot. This is a combination, just intro to all machining class. So we are gonna talk about lathe stuff just for a little bit. Um, lathes have in some ways simpler tooling than in mills, in other ways way more complicated. The nice thing about lathe tooling is in general, it's way cheaper. Because um, instead of needing this whole crazy spiraling fluted thing, you just need this one little bit at the tip that cuts and some stick that holds it. So it's not that hard. But there are all kinds of specialty lathe tools that you can get. You can get almost all of these in carbide or you can buy a high speed, high speed steel blank and grind these yourselves and uh, you, you choose you. Um, here's my, I think I already gave most of this speech a few times, but I'll give it again. Uh, tungsten carbide or carbide is the better material. Uh, it was way more expensive than high-speed steel up until about 1990. Um, since the like 90s onward, uh, it has been the cheaper, better choice for all professional machining. Um, and the high-speed steel surplus that was left in the world was kind of foisted onto the hobbyists. At this point, even it's so cheap, it's kind of insane as a hobbyist to even learn on high-speed steel tooling. Uh, like you can go out and find it. Like you can buy like a five pack of high speed steel bits on Amazon for like $10 or something. The carbide ones will cost $11 and they will last twice as long and they will cut uh, much faster. You just can't sharpen them. Oh no, you didn't know how to sharpen them anyway. Uh, so it's fine. Uh, I will, sorry, I'm going to go way back for a second. Just to talk about it. I have no idea what material these are, but some of these are actually tungsten carbide. Uh, when you pick up an end mill, they will make whole tungsten carbide end mills where the entire end mill is tungsten carbide. Just because it looks like one piece of metal doesn't mean it's high speed steel. Um, and with these weird coatings on them as well, you really can't tell uh, by introspection just what material it is. 
Most of them have markings on the shaft. It's important to read the markings on the shaft. HSS is high speed steel. Um, carbide is usually just says the word carbide on it. Um, I can tell the difference between carbide and, and high speed steel at this point just by holding them because carbide is significantly denser. Um, it's like one and a half times the density of high speed steel. So if you pick it up and it is denser, probably tungsten carbide. Um, there are other cutter materials out there, but you almost never see them anymore. Yeah. Uh, why is it called high speed steel? It's because it let you machine faster. It could let you run at higher speeds for machining. It's a special alloy of steel made for machining. That's where it comes from, just so you know. Uh, last major section we'll go through here, uh, safety. Um, have to talk about it because it is the most gruesome and worst injury. Uh, they will show you videos of this in like shop classes if you go take them in colleges still. Uh, loose threads and loose hair really, really, really kill. Um, they are one of the worst injuries that can happen in around any kind of spinning tool. Any kind of thing getting sucked in and entangled in the spinning piece is a really, really bad way to end your day. Um, machinists are really split, it seems like, on wearing gloves and not wearing gloves. I've heard different opinions from different people. I will say the majority of the newer machinists I talk to almost always wear uh, plastic gloves of some kind, vinyl gloves, like, like disposable surgical gloves, nitrile gloves. Um, nobody wears any kind of cloth glove or fiber glove while machining that with, if it gets touched, like threads are gonna pull in the machine. You never want loose threads on your hands. Most people also take off any kinds of rings dangling with it, but just can't say it enough. Do not have dangling hoodie strings, do not have uh, long sleeve shirts on with anything like roll your sleeves up, entanglement in the machine. Not that common that it happens, but gruesome grizzly death. Like we want to avoid gruesome grizzly death. Uh, we already talked about parts needing to be held correctly. They can fly everywhere. Chips can fly anywhere and in mills can break at any time. Safety glasses are a must. This is one that I think isn't brought up enough, but I've seen some people with some pretty horrible scars from it. These machining cutters are really sharp like really, really sharp. Um, they can horribly cut you very fast without you noticing. And the way that they sit, particularly on the milling machines, is the tool is pointed down right above your workpiece. And what happens way too much is people leave the tool in the machine as they go to clamp and unclamp their workpiece and they reach into the working area of the machine and they just slice their forearms open in pretty horrible ways. And particularly if you're like reaching in there with a wrench to like tighten one of those bolts or something and like the thing comes loose and your arm kicks around, you're probably not gonna die, but you can really slice your arm open. So it is incredibly good habit. And one of the things you'll be taught when you get checked off on the machines here, you put the tool in last, you take the tool out first. Before you clean off your workpiece, before you unmount your thing, tool comes out first so that there's just nothing sharp in there for you to get cut on as you go in. Um, and then the last safety thing, which like, I'll be honest, I've burned myself multiple times and it's not fun and I feel like an idiot so I have to include it, but you're not gonna die from burning yourself. Um, heat is generated here. Parts get really, really hot, even with coolant, even with uh, cutting oil. Um, it's common for things to be hundreds of degrees Celsius after a machining operation. Um, and like, Things don't always look hot. There's, your eyes don't see heat. Uh, so one of the most common things I've seen happen is you, cut, you part a, a piece off on the lathe. So like the parts in there, you use a parting tool, the part drops into the parts bin below the lathe and you reach down and you pick it up and then you scream and throw it across the room because it's like a thousand degrees, right? As it gets parted off. Happens a lot. Please just be aware of heat and like gingerly touch things, let things cool down. Really good to run some water over, th over like an aluminum part to get it to cool off before you burn yourself too bad. Um, last thing I'll leave as kind of my parting shot is uh, this is a good way to learn. What I honestly recommend like strongly to people interested in machining these days is YouTube Academy. Um, if you want to learn how to machine the best resources that I think will teach you the most, and have the most fun while doing it is checking out some of these YouTube channels and watching some of the incredible things that they machine. In particular, ClickSpring is one of the, like the number one reason I became a machinist. This guy has a tiny little shop with tiny little tools 
in the middle of nowhere, Australia. Um, and we want the... Yeah, uh, he has like 45 videos on hand making every single tool necessary to build this clock. We'll skip to the very end and then come back. Um, but uh, he not only made this clock, he made most of the tools to make this clock. Every single piece of them, bit by bit, just absolutely perfect precision, absolutely incredible stuff, made on tiny little benchtop machines behind it and made by hand. And he has such like good videos walking you through every step of the process, what chemicals he uses, how he sets up his speeds and feeds, how he puts stuff on the arbors. Like he goes through all of this in excruciating detail and boy howdy did he spend a lot of time doing it. So I think he's really, really good to start with because his style of machining, like tiny little pieces in brass that are machined well, incredibly friendly, incredibly easy to try to replicate, to try to come in and make some of the things that he made, not that hard to do, versus uh, like Titans of CNC is a really good place to go uh, to learn uh, why your CNC machine sucks, basically. These guys are like the pinnacle of professionals that are doing everything they possibly can to extract the most value out of $10 million CNC machines that they buy. Um, they make all of these videos about how you can remove more material than you possibly, like how to take those material removal rate calculations, throw them in the garbage and remove five times as much material with crazy, crazy programming. They do um, just absolutely buck wild stuff, but very detailed tutorials, lots of explanations in there, more geared towards the professionals. Um, last one that I'll give a shout out to, sorry, I'm, I have, I have, I'm a fan, boy, I love these guys. This old Tony. AKA Ray Romano. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just like videos about everything related to making stuff. He has an entire 18 minute video just on uh, ER20 collets. And it's titled, how much does a $3 collet cost? Cause he bought a $3 collet and then it wasn't concentric. And then he broke like hundreds of dollars in tools before he figured out that it was concentric. And he'll like my, three minute explanation of concentricity, he'll give you the 20 minute version of it really, really well. The particular video, if you're interested, that I would recommend is squaring stock. Uh, this man, I, he, it's, it's so informative. It's so interesting. He teaches you how to make a square block and it takes 25 minutes. But that's literally it. It's just like, how do you make something square? And he talks about where inaccuracy comes from on a mill and how your vice cannot be square and the vice cannot be square to the table and the head of your mill cannot be square and the thing cannot be trimmed and your tools cannot be squared. And he brings out a surface plate and shows you how to use a dial indicator and measure it and measure weight. It's not just that it's square. What if it was trapezoidal? Like you need to be able to account for different types of error in it. And at the end of the day, he comes up with a block that's like this side, that's zero. That's one thousandth of an inch higher on that side. And he starts measuring all of the different errors that come from flipping this part around. And like, it's a 25 minute video on how to make a square block. It's so interesting. <laughs> so um, yeah, I like, I cannot recommend it enough. As you are interested in machining, getting into machining, going and watching a bunch of these videos, I can point you if, you if you hit me up on Slack or ask about it to a ton of this content, but there is really, really good content out there uh, to, to equip you to, to learn without needing a huge amount of time on the machine. And frankly, like there are not great textbooks on learning how to machine. Machining is a thing that was taught person to person on a machine for years. Um, like YouTube videos are the best source that I know of today. Uh, final parting shot, two minutes left before I'm at time. Uh, these are the fundamentals of what you should remember. Like if you take things away from today's class, you should remember these six things. Uh, machines, fundamental physics are all about heat and energy. When we make good chips, we have efficient machining and low amounts of heats. We wanna reduce friction, we want good coatings on our stuff and we want cutting oil always. Feed per tooth and surface feet per minute control our surface finish and how well our material cuts. Those are set independently. Then if we want to control our horsepower, horsepower is controlled by feed rate, width of cut, and depth of cut. Um, yes. Uh, there are lots of options for bits and for work holding and chatter is bad. That's it. That's the whole, the whole class. You guys made it. Um, thank you. Hope that was fun. Uh, I will stick around for the next 
five, 10 minutes and answer any questions if you guys have more. Um, if you come back next week, we will figure out how to plug all that information into Fusion 360 and have it spit out G code that won't break our stuff. So, sweet.